Right then, I think we're going to get started. So, hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Student Bites. This is your weekly source of insight into being LGBT in business and in graduate recruitment. My name is George Wright, and I am the student engagement lead here at MyGWO, um, responsible for our student outreach and our graduate opportunities. If you've got a question, want to talk, or just want to find out more about what we do, please do not hesitate to drop me an email. This week we're joined by law firm Lewis Silkin. Lewis Silkin is a partner of MyGWork and their job postings, events and company page can be found over on our network at MyGWork. But before we get into our panel, let's take a look at this week's news. We start with the news that broke yesterday evening in America. In a historic ruling for LGBT plus rights, the US Supreme Court protected LGBT workers from job discrimination making it illegal for employers to fire people because of their gender identity or sexual orientation. The court ruled that employers who fire individuals merely for being gay or transgender violate Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which bans discrimination on the basis of sex and other characteristics, but not specifically gender identity or sexual orientation. An employer who fires an individual for being homosexual or transgender fires that person for traits or actions it would not have questioned in members of different sex, wrote Conservative Justice Neil Gorsh, Donald Trump's first appointee to the High Court, who authored the majority opinion. Sex plays a necessary and undisguisable role in the decision, exactly what Title VII forbids. President Alfonso David, president of the Human Rights Campaign, held the historic decision, stating no one should be denied a job or fired simply because of who they are or whom they love. Although he said, more work remains to be done. Nickelodeon has officially announced SpongeBob is a member of the LGBT plus community. While celebrating hashtag pride with the LGBT community and other allies this month and every month, as the channel wrote on its Twitter account, three pictures of Nickelodeon characters were uploaded. SpongeBob, Schwoz Schwartz from Henry Danger, and Cora from Avatar. After the reveal, the fact became a top trending moment on Twitter. Lots had speculated in the past that SpongeBob was gay, although it has never been made official, and Nickelodeon has not yet specified his exact identity. After the Twitter upload, the channel turned off replies to its tweets. Back in 2005, the show's creator, Stephen Hillenburg, said that SpongeBob and his friend Patrick are not gay, rather saying he thinks they're asexual. It doesn't have anything to do with what we're trying to do, Hillenburg said at the time. We never intended them to be gay. I consider them to be almost asexual. We're just trying to be funny, and this has got nothing to do with the show. Returning to the USA, Rosemary Ketchum has won a seat on the Wheeling, West Virginia, USA City Council, making history as the first trans person elected to a public office in the state. Ketchum has served as the Associate Director of NAMI of Greater Wheeling, an affiliate of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, a member of the Wheeling Human Rights Commission, and the Board of Directors for the American Civil Liberties Union of West Virginia, and was the recipient of the 2019 West Virginia Wonder Woman Award. As LGBTQ Nation reports, she advocates for making Wheeling a city for all, with a plan to combat addiction and homelessness, along with many other public issues. Rosemary has shattered a lavender ceiling in West Virginia and will join a growing number of trans elected officials serving nationwide, said Mayor Anise Parker, president and CEO of the LGBTQ Victory Fund. The organization endorsed Ketchum's candidacy. The Freedom to Donate campaign and politicians from several political parties in the UK have published a letter on World Blood Donor Day to Health Minister Helen Watley, calling for the restrictions on gay and bi men donating blood to be lifted. The letter reads, Dear Minister, today is World Blood Donor Day, a time to encourage more people to donate blood. As with so much of life during COVID-19, it feels different this year. Due to lockdown, for the first time, many people who were previously excluded from donating blood are now able to do so. However, there are still many thousands of men who have sex with men that are unable to donate. Whilst those men who may be able to safely donate continue to be excluded, the NHS Blood and Transplant Service has stated that the need for donations from young men are vital due to a serious gender imbalance in new donors. It adds, only 41% of new donors were men last year. We, the undersigned, believe that the time has come to review and update the restrictions on blood donor eligibility, 
It has been two years since NHSBT commented, uh, committed rather, to exploring how many more people can safely donate. We support the work of Freedom to Donate and other LGBT groups in advocating an individualised risk assessment model. On World Blood Donor Day, we believe that those who are willing to donate blood and could do so safely should be able to. Among those MPs who signed the letter include Conservatives Crispin Blunt, Damien Moore and William Wragg, mm. Labour politicians Dame Diana Johnson and Kate Osborne, Liberal Democrat politicians Sir Ed Davey, Leila Moran and Jamie Stone, SNP politicians Hannah Bardell and Murray Black, and the Green Party's sole MP Caroline Lucas. Caroline Noakes, the chairwoman of the Women's Equality Select Committee, also signed the letter and said, as NHS blood and transplant calls for thousands of new male donors to secure the blood supply, willing volunteers who could donate safely are being excluded because of a system which fails to treat people as individuals. For those uninitiated, Student Bites is a weekly webinar where we talk to different inclusive companies and their staff to learn about what it's like to be LGBT in the workplace and how you can get where you want to be. If you have a question, please feel free to type it in the chat or the Q&A section, and we'll come to them at the end for our panel members to discuss. This week, we're joined by Anna Bond and Joe Evans from Lewis Silkin. Anna is a senior associate in the employment team at Lewis Silkin and advises on a wide range of employment matters with a particular focus on discrimination issues, litigation and investigations work. Before moving into law, Anna studied modern languages. Further to this, Anna sits on Lewis Silkin's diversity board and is co-head of the LGBT strand. Outside of work, Anna is a trustee of Bi Pride UK, which last year put on the UK's first ever Bi Pride. Joe has been a corporate partner at Lewis Silkin since 2000. She heads up Lewis Silkin's diversity and inclusion board and is one of the three partners of the firm's partner remuneration committee. Joe has more than 20 years experience representing and assisting the owners of privately owned businesses on the implementation of their growth plans and exit strategies. Nearly all of the people and businesses she represents operate in the creative economy, in marketing, media, communications, data, and digital enterprises. As well as corporate transactional work, Joe advises clients on a broad range of corporate matters, such as LLP and company formation, joint venture and shareholder agreements, incentive share agreements, raising growth capital and other inward investment and capital restructuring reorganizations. So let me unmute and welcome uh, our panel members. How are we all this afternoon? Very well, thank you, George. Hello, hello, it's lovely to talk to you. I suppose my first question would simply be if you could just tell us a little bit more about who Lewis Silkin are and the work they do. Sure, I'll, I'll start off and Anna can um, interrupt me if I get it wrong or, or, or miss anything out. Um, so we're um, a, a commercial law firm, offices in uh, London, Oxford, Cardiff, uh, Hong Kong and Dublin. Um, half of the firm um, are employment lawyers um, covering the complete range of, uh, of employment law advice from uh, immigration to incentives, um, investigations, um, right the way across the board and Anna can talk a bit more about that um, and the other half of the firm is more of a, a sector focus and we concentrate on the creative economy so um, everything from advertising agents to data specialists um, and we provide those clients with um, all of their legal needs whether it's um, uh, property, commercial, intellectual property, uh, patents, trademarks, corporate advice, real estate advice, commercial advice, litigation. Um, so that's broadly the, broadly the firm. Fantastic, a very sort of wide reach then. Right, I suppose I'll, I'll jump straight into then, um, just to, I suppose we'll start with you, Joe, as we're here. So how did you get into your current career at Lewis Silkin and what was it that made you want to apply for the job? Um, I had to uh, scratch my head and go back a bit on this actually, because I'll have been at Lewis Silkin for 27 years in September. Um, so um, yes, so why, why I joined Lewis Silkin is, is back in the annals of, of history. <laughs> Um, and, and I suppose that the truth was um, uh, I, I was finished university in the, uh, in the mid to late 1980s and didn't really know what I wanted to do. So um, I worked in the travel industry for quite a while, including a year as a flotilla skipper um, in Turkey. And while I was out there, I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, but I didn't have any lawyer friends. Um, there was no such thing as the Internet, so it was very difficult to research firms. 
Um, and uh, I started at um, law school anyway to do my GDL and, and what was what was now the LPC. Um, and I'd almost I'd made about 90 applications for training contracts um, and, and I hadn't managed yet to secure a job and I'd kind of almost given up. Um, and then someone at law school said that Lewis Silkin was looking to take on some additional trainees um, that September. Uh, and we, this was Easter. So I really had given up hope of, of ever getting a training contract. Um, but I um, applied for one of these additional positions and had an interview and uh, secured the job um, and started there the, the following September. Um, so um, I suppose it's less of why did I choose Lewis Silkin, but more um, I feel lucky to have been chosen by Lewis Silkin at the time. Fantastic. And Anna, your story, where, where, what are we looking at? Hi. Hi, everyone. My name's Anna. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and as George mentioned, I'm a senior associate in the employment team at Lewis Silken and also the co-head of the LGBT strand of the diversity board at Lewis Silken. Um, and I identify as bisexual. So why did I want to apply to Lewis Silken? Um, going right back to before I was in law, I came from a non-law background. I actually studied modern languages as my first degree rather than law. Uh, and then I did law conversion course um, and the the GDL and then the LPC. So that was the routine for me. Uh, and that was a fantastic routine, I think, because I was always interested in law. I always knew that was one of the options I was most interested in. But I had a real passion for languages as well. And for me, that was has worked out really, really well because now I work in employment law, but I work in Spanish and Italian for my, um, my languages at university. I didn't train at Lewis Silken. I moved over as an associate. And for me, a big part of the appeal was that it's an absolutely fantastic place to work as an employment lawyer. There's a huge focus on employment law. We have the biggest employment team in the UK. Um, we were named the law firm of the year for labor, employment and pensions in who's who legal this year. And I also just love the feel of the firm. It feels very human. It feels very personal. I feel like everyone's really encouraged to be themselves. Uh, and also I like that you're given a lot of autonomy at an early stage at the firm. Fantastic. So I'm going to go straight ahead. Uh, and after, I mean, obviously everything has changed at the moment with coronavirus, but I just wondered if we could get an idea of what your office like was like before all of this. I don't know, Joe, if you want to, what your kind of day to day is once you're sort of into the office in the morning. Um, sure. So um, I think the, the biggest change uh, for me over the last um, two years actually has been um, the move away from um, cellular offices uh, where you might have shared. Um, you might have had an office by yourself or, or shared with a, with another person and um, and we have we had a kind of uh, a history I suppose of having um, a senior person in a room with a junior person so if you're a trainee you would have been in a room with a you know with a with a partner or with a senior associate um, or you might have a senior associate and a junior associate in, in a room together um, and there was um, you know a learning a learning curve and a learning pattern there so you know your, your senior might um, hear you on the, on the telephone to clients and at the end of a call would say, maybe you could have said this a bit differently or, or, or vice versa. And if you're a junior person um, sitting in a room hearing how the partner or the, the senior lawyer sort of converses to clients or colleagues actually is, it's just a really good way of, um, of, of learning some of the softer skills around, um, you know, being a lawyer. Um, and, and I think there were, you know, three or four years ago, there were, there were people in our firm who would say, and, you know, that's the way it is, and, and that's the way it um, should always be, because that's obviously the perfect model. Um, and I think we've uh, clearly broken that down in, in stages um, over the last um, year or so. Um, and many more of us now sit in open plan. Um, and I moved into open plan um, about 18 months ago, probably nearly two years ago now. Um, and um, it's been a brilliant experience for me. I love, I love just um, being in a, sort of, we call it the hub. So being in the hub with sort of six or seven other people, um, you know, listening, l listening onto their conversations and knowing that my conversation with Lisa is absolutely, is actually fine and you learn a lot. Um, and the sort of the, you know, the general um, sort of, you know, hubbub of, of chat and noise and um, the occasional breaks for a, a game of darts on the wall or um, someone's done some baking and sort of you know we'll break and uh, share a cake um, I just you know it's uh, it's just a lovely convivial atmosphere um, and then of course very recently we're now all working from home and doing many more meetings like this and uh, and yet again you know there's a there's another way that we can work in a very productive way um, and it just shows I think how, how versatile uh, we can all be um, but on a day-to-day -day, um, basis I'm 
you know, most of my clients are um, independent creative agencies of, of some kind, um, either, you know, contemplating a, a sale or, or gearing up for a sale or contemplating an acquisition. Um, and most of my day is, is, is spent talking to them through, through those kind of transactions or, or negotiating those transactions with, with, with lawyers on, on the other side, acting for the buyer or the seller as the case may be. Um, I'm working in sort of smaller groups. So I'm um, usually I'm working just with, um, with a trainee or, or a junior associate on a, on, on a transaction to see that through. Excellent. And Anna, yourself? So I still sit in one of our cellular offices looking at what office life is like. Um, I sit in a room with five people, so it's quite quite a big group of cellular offices go. Still a good opportunity to learn from people around me and uh, office support to people around me as well. I would echo that it's an incredibly friendly place to work. It is very easy to chat to people, even when we were all in small offices. I've always, always found it incredibly easy just to knock on the door, pop your head into a very senior partner and say, hello, please, can you help me with something? Or can I get your view on something? Um, in terms of my day-to-day -day work, one of the reasons I'm still in an office rather than in the open plan hub is that I do quite a lot of uh, investigations work. So this is if, uh, um, for example, an employee raises a grievance about something, we will actually go and speak to that employee and run the investigation rather than just giving legal advice. So we've seen an awful lot of that um, coming up after the Me Too movement over the last couple of years, and then more recently in the Black Lives Matter movement. We've seen more grievances being raised about issues of sexual harassment and race discrimination. So quite a lot of my work is uh, involves investigations into those things. I also offer just sort of general day-to-day -day employment support to employers, things like grievances, disciplinaries, restructures, litigation, tribunal claims that come in. And then I also work with individuals, so employees who might be facing issues of discrimination at work, uh, whistleblowers, that sort of thing, or just any other contractual uh, issues that might arise in the course of employment. Fantastic, thank you both very much for that. I'm gonna move uh, our discussion now towards uh, the LGBT network at uh, Lewis Silk. And I think, Anna, I believe you, you chair the LGBT strand of Lewis Silkin's diversity network. I just wonder if you just tell us a little bit more kind of about sort of the work that that strand does, but is it, you know, does it stand alone from the network? Is it, where is it, you know, is it a wider part of it? Where does that sort of fit in? Absolutely, yeah. so I, I, I co-head the LGBT plus strand, as we call it, and that strand is part of the diversity board. So we have six strands of which LGBT plus is one, and we all meet monthly in the diversity board. And then we also meet individually as separate strands, so the LGBT plus strand also meets once a month and talks about the things we're focusing on. Um, well, it's, it's such a big topic, all the things we um, want to do and the things we do do. I think fundamentally for me, one of the most important things that we need to do as a strand is create visibility um, for anybody who identifies within the LGBT plus umbrella. I think if you can't see yourself represented at work, it can be really lonely and it's always a little bit uncomfortable if you're not entirely sure whether there's anybody else who you identify with in a certain way in, in the same firm as you, in the same company as you. And I think that can be particularly the case for more minoritized identities within the LGBT plus umbrella. So anybody who's not cisgender, gay and white, for example, you've got um, you know, ad additional considerations. And it's important to us uh, as a group to address that in the best way we can. So for example, we always try to mark days um, celebrating various communities. So we've marked Bi Visibility Day, Trans Day of Remembrance, Trans Day of Visibility. Um, we're also writing an article for Non-Binary People's Day this year. And then we also have events to bring people together and mark uh, Pride season, as I know is popular with a lot of employers. So for example, last year we had uh, a party to mark Pride. And the theme, if you like, of that party was to bring out the various flags within the LGBT plus umbrella. So not just focusing on rainbows everywhere, but we had food themed around the different flags, decorations to try and sort of encourage people to ask, oh, what's that flag? I don't recognise that one and, and you know, stimulate a bit of conversation around different identities. And that was absolutely wonderful. Um, I also try very hard to be as personally visible as I can because I think it's really important to be able to see people. So in addition to you know, stuff we do as a board, I um, pretty openly speak about being bisexual um, when I can. This year, we are having more of a focus on sort of education pieces in our Pride celebration. So one thing we want to do this Pride Month is to focus around the origins of Pride and specifically focusing on trans people of colour who were at the forefront of Pride 
in particular, uh, you know, looking at what's going on in the world at the moment. Some wonderful good news stories, George, at the beginning, but I think important to recognise this year that it's not all good news, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, yeah, so we want to um, focus on that, some sort of more educational pieces in our five celebrations. Fantastic. I, you mentioned, you know, sort of about being very proud, you know, being able to openly be yourself, sort of very proud of yourself. <laughs> If I may sort of, I'd sort of almost ask you, Joe, since you mentioned you've, you've been at the firm almost 27 years, I imagine you've probably seen a, a massive, or maybe not a massive, but you've seen a shift definitely probably in cultures within the legal sector around being, you know, openly LGBT at work. And I just wonder, uh, Joe, if you had any thoughts on whether or not there are still barriers to being yourself at work that maybe were there, I said, when you started working or, or sort of where the profession is on that, maybe. So that's a really interesting question. And, um, I think the truth is when I joined Lewis Silkin, um, I was aware that um, one of the partners was a, was, was a gay man and was um, openly gay at work. And honestly, I was probably the first month into my training contract in so October 1993 when um, I felt comfortable enough to, to come out and um, trying to stop talking about my um, partner at home in a kind of a gender neutral way, you know, as, as we all do in those conversations where, where we're not I'm sure of how, how the truth is going to be accepted on the other side. Um, and so, you know, it, it was actually, you know, it was back in October 93 when um, I, I came out as being, as being gay at the firm. Um, and I can honestly say I'm not conscious of within the firm having received any, um, uh, any detriment at all or, or, or felt any um, prejudice, um, even, even way back then and, and, and going back then, um, as a woman, I was a, um, I'm working in the city because obviously, you know, corporate lawyer is, is generally quite a, a male dominated um, practice area and still is. Um, and it would be very common for me to go into meetings and be the only woman um, in the meeting, um, apart from the woman, of course, who was serving the coffee to all the men sitting around the table. Um, and um, I'm still wearing skirts. I had to wear skirts at work until um, uh, until the uh, I don't know, probably about sort of 1997, 1998. Um, and if anyone who knows me knows how reluctantly I would put on a skirt nowadays, that would uh, you know, feel something weird. I often felt like I was slightly in drag when I appeared to work in my, in my, in my skirt suit. Um, but I think if I've noticed a change really over the last um, 27 years, um, it is in the wider profession. I think there are, um, it's, that there is much more visibility of, uh, of LGBT plus um, people. Um, and, and of course, that's a that's a fantastic thing. Um, I, I completely agree with Anna that having role models is is so important. And so, um, for me, it's always been, um, you know, I've I've never you know shied away at work. I've always been very open about being gay, um, and I'd hope that's encouraged um, the many people who have joined the firm in the years since to you know to feel to feel safe and um, and secure in being able to do that and to, to bring them whole selves to work. Um, I had a role model, which, as I said, was the, was the partner who was at our firm then. Um, and uh, he became sort of a mentor for me um, over the years, and that's been fantastically helpful. Um, he, he's currently married to the, to the master of the roles, um, who's the Terence Everton, uh, another fantastic role model within our profession. Um, and I had a, a chat with um, Terry a little while ago, who, who's, who's still slightly embarrassed at being the first ever master of the roles uh, to have a husband. Um, which I said says more for the LGBT influence within the judiciary than the um, uh, progress of women um, through the judiciary, but that's probably a topic for another day. Um, so yeah, things have you know things have changed enormously and um, and all for the good. Um, but um, as Anna said, not always all good news, and, and there's a long way to go on on many fronts. Fantastic. I'm actually really interested to think about because you mentioned so at the at the beginning talking about um, referring to partners in like non non sort of binary way, um, and uh, yeah, I see you and as sort of non like oh, I think we're all very familiar with them. I'm sure, people watching very familiar too. I mean, a lot of at least as from my understanding of the legal sort of career, you know, there's there's this whole it's a it's a client facing job. You know, you'll be interacting with clients. You know, as Anna, you mentioned sort of the way of providing sort of employment advice a lot of that work we're trying to bring in clients and i just wondered if like if it was something that you were you know you were genuinely able to bring your whole self to work so particularly you know when you're dealing with clients i know Anna said you mentioned you deal with you know companies sort of abroad as well sort of the, the languages front if there's ever really been that kind of like barrier with being able to bring yourself like to that work as well i don't know so Anna, if you had any thoughts on that personally in this role that i'm in now no never um i 
I think over the different stages of my career, I've kind of been progressively more out in each role. So maybe when I first went into the world of work straight out of university, I sort of did go back into the closet a little bit. I was like, you know, I've read a lot about that happening to a lot of people because you suddenly in a new world and you think, actually, I'm not really sure where I stand, what's my footing in this professional world rather than at uni. So I was um, not as out initially in my first roles, but as soon as I was at Lewis Silken, I think partially because I sort of personally reached a point where I wasn't willing to go into the closet anymore, and partially because I felt it was so um, publicly a, a very kind of welcoming and friendly atmosphere, I just made the decision I'm not going to do it anymore. For me, it's more, it, and, and that applies with clients as well, you know, I sort of take the approach of if I would say this uh, about a male partner, I will say it about a partner of any other gender as well. Um, I, it feels appropriate to talk about my personal life with a client because we're having you know, a reasonably friendly relationship. I would always feel comfortable talking about a, a girlfriend, for example. Excellent. Joe, about you? Yeah, don't know, Joe, if, you, if you've had any sort of similar thoughts or... Um... No, I, 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 I agree that, that for now. I think if, if, I'm, if I'm really truthful, I think back in the, in the late 1990s, there were certain clients who um, I thought would be, um, who I thought would be uncomfortable if, they, if they'd known about my sexuality. And, and I suppose I wasn't, um, you know, brave enough to, you know, to challenge that or, or um, not, I suppose you didn't, just didn't want to dam damage, you know, the, the client relationship. Honestly, now um, I I'm, I wouldn't have any hesitation about almost with anybody uh, about you know, being out. I'm, I'm I'm very out, and if people don't like it, then I tend to think that's um, generally their their problem and, and, and not mine. And I know that I'd be supported within the firm if that was the position I decided to take. Fantastic. So I'm always mindful that the law also supports that position as a discrimination specialist. Absolutely. I've always yeah. got that in the back of my mind, so that helps. No, but that's fantastic, you know, that you're able to actually, you, you can go to work and you can feel like that. And no, I said, certainly the, the, the company's got you back, but to know you said on, on software, the law's got you back as a lawyer, I imagine, you know, quite sort of a pleasant one to put together, definitely. Just to go back to the um, LGBT, so the LGBT strand of the diversity network, just out of curiosity, so how is that sort of integrated into, how are staff integrated into that? Is it, can you go straight to the LGBT strand or do you just go to the wider diversity sort of network? You know, are there any sort of, potential for crossover how is that sort of managed if I, if I may ask yeah of course so everybody's free to join the the LGBT group we have a, an email list where we have sort of internal events internal discussions socials that sort of thing um, we also are part of a network called Legal Best which is a network of slightly smaller law firms who work together pull our resources pull our knowledge I think it could be helpful for slightly smaller organisations to sort of widen out your network and allow you to make connections at other firms, which is great, and just get a bit more momentum because in smaller firms you don't always get a huge number of people. Um, but from day one, everybody's very, very welcome to um, be part of either of those groups. Then we also um, work hard to engage allies around the firm who don't identify as LGBT plus themselves as well. So one thing we did, for example, Last year, as part of our Pride celebrations, we invited everybody to sign a pledge. We had a massive board up in reception. Everybody signed it. It was encouraged to sign it, write a message, think about what they were going to do for LGBT plus quality over the next year. So we tried to sort of engage the wider workforce as well. Really sort of bringing allies into it. That's a really interesting idea, actually. You know, we sort of hear a lot about sort of diversity networks, but I think that's that active, like that real drive to actually visualise it, I suppose, for allies. To really say, look, what are you going to do? You know, where and, and let them see what other people are doing. Coordinate. That's really like, you know, that's, that's quite imaginative. I, I quite like that. If you don't mind, I'm going to now turn the, sort of the, uh, the attention of uh, the webinar towards more of the, the graduate recruitment um, side of things. And I just wondered if one of you would be able to talk us through how uh, a graduate could come to join the firm and sort of what that sort of progression they're looking at. So I don't know, Joe, if you'd be able to tell us sort of how, how you sort of hire graduates. Yep, sure. Happy to do that. Um, so we, we don't do formal vacation schemes um, anymore. We um, run a um, spring workshop um, and uh, graduates are invited to apply for that. The um, application form, obviously, which is all um, online, um, and we gear that to um, really trying to find out the information about the people that um, that we need, rather than just the kind of you know vanilla you know submit your submit your CV. So 
uh, we're interested in all work experience, not just legal work experience. We're interested um, in uh, people's career history, if, if, that's, um, in, if that's relevant. Obviously, academics are very important um, to us. Um, and how, how we would perceive that person would interact with our culture and, and our values. Um, I said earlier about you know how, how things have changed um, with LGBT in the wider profession, but probably not within Lewis Silk. And if I think if there's been one constant throughout my uh, many years at the firm, it's been um, how uh, how true we are to our to, to, to our culture, um, you know, which includes inclusiveness and being brave and being kind, um, and holding those values um, very dear. And all the decisions that we make have those uh, have those values at, at their core. Um, so as part of our application, we're, you know, we're looking to attract people who will add to, um, you know, that culture um, and carry on bringing it to life and carrying on seeing it through, you know, the next um, generation. So um, we try in, in during our kind of, you know, selection processes to try and um, choose people who we believe would adhere to those um, kind of values. Um, and why you know, the, the application form will try and seek as well and our process try and seek is to um, why that person would be um, a really good lawyer for us um, and how they would um, you know contribute to the to the firm and help develop the firm and, and grow the business of the firm um, in in the long term um, and you know we're looking for people who, who are passionate about about what we do and um, who you know um, are, you know are really keen as Anna was really keen to do the kind of um, to do the kind of work um, that the firm does, but also to deliver that kind of work in a way that our clients um, you know, would appreciate and um, and expect us to you know to, to deliver that. Um, so you know, in a way, you know, why why would that person be applying to Lewis Silkin? What is special about Lewis Silkin that, that that makes that person think they would be able to you know to join us and, and make make our firm an even better place? Fantastic. We hear a lot, I mean, you know, understandably as sort of city firms that, you know, there's going to be sort of a high application rate. And I just wondered if either of you had any sort of tips on what you think would make an application stand out and what you're really, you know, what, what individual things are going to pop up and you say, wow, that's, you know, I don't know. Uh, so, yeah. Shall I carry on, Anna? Should I do a bit and then you join in? Yeah, then I'll tip in. Okay. Um, and I think it's 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 keen it's it's important to note as well that our um, you know processes um, are, are are done blind. So I mean I you know that so so any applications when they come in they're done blind. So no references to you know to, to school or to gender or to age. Um, to, to so to, to to make it as fair as we possibly can as inclusive as we um, possibly can. Um, um, I think one of the things that we're really keen to how how is it that people have approached challenges in their lives? How have they, um, you know, whether it's a personal challenge or, or or a work challenge, how have they how have they approached that? How have they overcome you know that challenge in a in a creative and a, in a thoughtful way? Um, and and getting those kind of messages across, I think, is uh, is really important in, in the application. Research is incredibly important. Um, you know, there is so much information online uh, about the firm and the work that we do and, and, the, uh, and, and the qualities that, you know, that we hold dear. Um, and anyone making an application, you know, research and preparation is just so vital. Um, you know, you have to stand out um, in, in a crowded market. So you need to make your application as personable and as targeted to the, to the firm as you can. I think would be my, my key, my overall tip. Fantastic. Yeah. Anna, if, if, if you had any tips you wanted to add to that. Mm, I would absolutely agree with that. I think if you are enthusiastic about the firm, show your enthusiasm by having a look into the background work, finding out about it. And I would extend that out to if you are enthusiastic, passionate about a particular area of law, for example, how are you going to show that? I mean, if I think about my own practice, I'm very interested in trans and non-binary discrimination. So for example, I might be ready to talk about the recent GRA consultation, uh, recent tribunal judgments involving trans employees, that kind of thing. Do some reading around, do something that will mark you out as someone who not only can express you know, a, a preference in particular areas of law, but actually can show that from having done some reading around it and having something you'd be interested to discuss. Fantastic. We're fortunate enough, actually, uh, that we've had a uh, trainee from Lewis Silkin has fortunately very generously given us a video on further tips on uh, research as well and we can find that so to the attendees that will be coming to you in the pack 
afterwards. However, I'd sort of follow on with that. I just wondered, like, if you had any sort of what what to you? I think a lot, one of the big questions, particularly um, that you get with these applications, generally, you know, why why commercial law? Why a career in the city? And I just wondered if either of you really, you know, knew how you'd perhaps tackle that or have sort of tackled that question. What are your motivations for this kind of role, if I may ask? I don't know, maybe Joe, if you wanted to start and or. Um, when, I, when I first decided I wanted to become a lawyer, the answer that I gave was, I think that there are practitioners who make the law sound very complicated and seem to make, um, to, to, to delight in making it complicated as a kind of a rarefied practice that only very smart, very clever people can do. Uh, and my belief was actually, it's not that complicated. You need to be quite bright. Um, but I, I set out with a plan of trying to make complicated things simple for people to understand and to help clients through complicated transactions. And when I get feedback now, when I've completed the transaction and someone says, um, Joe, it was really great working with you. You know, I thought it was such a complicated thing and actually you made it really easy to understand. If someone's saying that to me 27 years after I've been doing this, I kind of feel I'm still hitting that mark. That was what I wanted to do. That's what I set out to do. And I'm pleased I'm still doing that. So, so I agree with Anna, work, work out you know, what it is that you want to do, where is your passion? What is the thing about law that really attracts you to being a lawyer? Uh, what is the thing about the firm that you're applying to that really attracts you to that firm? And um, you know, live and breathe that in the experiences that you're able to bring to bear on, on, on the application form. Um, so you know, I, I love being a commercial lawyer. I love advising clients on how to you know, get the best out of their businesses when they sell it. Um, it is a complicated process. And if I can help them understand that so that when they get to the end of the transaction, they haven't just got through it, they've actually enjoyed it and they've enjoyed working with me and they've enjoyed working with my team and they've got a good result, then I feel that that's a, that's a win. So that would be my motivation for doing it. Fantastic. And, and Anna, if you wanted to you know, answer that perhaps. Joe, that's such a lovely answer. I love that. I think mine is quite similar, actually. Um, it is... I love helping people to understand exactly that, things that seem complicated, but when you draw down to them, helping people to understand them in simple terms. Um, something I personally love about it is that it is quite academically challenging, generally speaking. So the law is always evolving, developing, situations will always change um, and different facts will apply obviously in each case. So it's, it's never dull and always quite stimulated by it. I also absolutely love how very directly I can see the impact of what I do on um, individuals. So working with employees in particular, you can you know, very directly see the impact on the person you're working with, which I really enjoy. Fantastic. Uh, so we've kind of skirted around it, um, but the whole premise of lockdown going on kind of hence why we're doing this virtually now. I just wondered if either of you had any sort of tips for graduates, because a lot of people and a lot of we here at the moment is that people going, you know, how can I be using lockdown, you know, wisely with, you know, things like researching for firms, etc. I don't know if you had any advice on what students could be doing at the moment, you know, to make the most of their lockdown so that they're sort of ready for when they come out of that. So that even if it is just so that when an employer asks, you know, what did you do during lockdown? They can say, oh, well, you know, I, I don't know if either of you had any thoughts on what might be. What particular, maybe perhaps what a corporate law firm might be looking for from graduates out of this period at all? I think doing things like this, attending things like this is a great starting point, you know, showing that you are actually spending your time and interested and uh, tapping into things. I'll go back to the point I mentioned before, if there's an area you're interested in and passionate about, use the time to read around it, find out what's going on in the news about it, um, pair that way. And obviously researching firms you mentioned, just echo that, that's a, a really good starting point as well. Using using all of that bonus and extra time you've got to sort of really, you know, get sort of get into something fantastic. Or, or with a recognition that lockdown is really difficult and we can't all be productive all the time in it. Just feel like it's worth saying that because, you know, we're all feeling that, I'm certainly feeling that. Mm. Excellent. And, and Joe, I don't know if, if you have... No, I can, I, I'm not sure anything to add to that. I think those are all very good suggestions. Fantastic. So I'm going to take us over to our uh, students for questions in a moment. We'll sort of run through some of their questions. So if you do have a question, please feel free uh, to leave it in the chat um, or possibly the q and if I can get the Q&A to work. Um, but before we, so while we wait for the questions to come in, I do have one sort of last uh, question from me, as it were, and that's simply, you know, what kind of takeaway message do you have for any graduates watching this, perhaps, who want to pursue a career like yours? 
two things for me. The first is if you are really passionate about one particular area or one particular thing within law, don't, don't give up on that. I think personally the sort of area of law you're in can be really important and if you know you're passionate about something as I knew I was, um, you know, I, I think it's important to focus on that. And the other thing I would say from a sort of more LGBT plus perspective, um, don't hide bits of yourself, I, I, I would um, advise as much as possible. I think in any application you're looking for a firm that's a good fit for you as well as looking for a firm that you know, um, you get a, a job at. And it's a, an interview process both ways, you know, you're speaking to the employer to work out, is this the kind of culture I want to work in, is this a culture I can be comfortable in? And I think if you're hiding bits of yourself, often you're hiding the best bits of yourself. So for me, I'm so passionate about what I do, partly because of my um, identity. Fantastic. I said, Joe, I don't know if you have sort of what your takeaway message would be. Yeah, I think my, uh, I mean, I think it's come out from the themes from what we've talked about already, which is, um, you know, be, be truthful to yourself in, in your application. And um, you know, if, if you put something down that, that you're really passionate about it, then be really passionate about it um, and be able to show that and, and demonstrate it. And I suppose my other takeaway is be, you know, be, be open and alive to, you know, to new situations and opportunities as well. I think um, lots of people having sort of, you know, Either, either studied law or studied something else and then then done the conversion will have an idea in their head about the kind of lawyer they want to be and, and, and what they want to do without really having experienced the different kinds of law that there are so be prepared to change your mind if um, you know uh, Anna has always wanted to be an employment lawyer and that's great and she's a fantastic employment lawyer um, but um, you know two, two years in if she decided actually corporate law was really what she wanted to do then, then be brave enough to, 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 to admit that sometimes new things come across your path which are even more exciting than the path that you were on already and, and be brave to take those opportunities. Fantastic. Right, I'm gonna take us over to our uh, students and graduates questions. I'm gonna start with another one. This is actually around uh, the application process. Um, I asked friends of mine who were previous applicants and trainees at Lewis Silkin often told me of an application question which stumped them. Uh, and it's, if you could have dinner with any fictional character in literature, who would it be and why? Um, and so I thought it would be of interest if I put that to both Anna and Joe, as well as ask what they think it reveals about a candidate. So can, I go, can I go first? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, because I, I have my fictional character. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of the, uh, the Patrick O'Brien um, Master and Commander stories, and, and I'm rereading them as lockdown. There are 21 stories in the book. So my, my, my first um, dinner guest would be Jack Aubrey. Um, so that I could talk to him about his many um, sort of naval experiences and actually having seen your good news bits at the beginning uh, my, my second dinner guest would be Spongebob Squarepants. <laughs> Fantastic and Anna? I think the honest answer and I would caveat this in the way that I'm going to caveat now um, would be Don Quixote because of my Spanish degree background and you know I've just spent so much of my life reading that book but I would caveat it by saying I am very surprised that it is a straight cisgender white man that I've chosen. <laughs> <laughs> and then I suppose sort of like peer into that a little bit more deeply says, you know, what, what you think that reveals about a candidate. I don't know if, any, if either of you have any thoughts on, on what that sort of question shows at all. I don't. I, I, I think there, there, are a couple of there are a couple of things underlying it. Okay. It's, um, we, we've said already, the kind, we, we, we like to have creative thinkers joining us at Liz Silkin and people who aren't just going to blend in. Um, but who are really going to have, that they'll have the opportunity to, and we'd like people to really feel that, that they can and they do make a difference, um, even as trainees, those, those trainees uh, in, in our firm, you know, make a huge difference in, in so many different ways and a, and a massive contribution. So um, some of the questions that we ask, and it might be that kind of question, be a different kind of question, really is just to um, allow someone to be a little bit creative in their thinking to bring something new to what might be otherwise a very well rehearsed set of answers to a fairly standard um, raft of questions. Um, and I think we will always have questions for our, um, our applicants at, at whatever level we're recruiting through the firm, which is not necessarily something that you can rehearse for, okay? It's something that you just might need to think about that on the spot and give an answer. And that's about life, you know, sometimes when you're, you know, interviewing with clients, you're asked a question that you haven't been able to rehearse and research and you have to have a think about it and be able to think on your feet. So I think there are a number of um, 
you know, things underpinning that, that question, the answers to which can be quite revealing about, about the person who's giving the answer. Fantastic. So that, that reinvention of the question on what sort of biscuit would you be that people throw exactly. around so much when they talk about exactly. recruitment. And Anna, I don't know if, uh, if you had anything you want to add to that at all. I appreciate Joe's answer was very comprehensive on what that might. Fantastic. No worries then. So we'll go to some of the other questions. Uh, first one we have, how important do you think it is that we still celebrate pride throughout lockdown? Don't know if Anna, you want to start that. Ah, uh, I think it's so important. I have felt this so personally, the lack of in-person Pride events. So outside of work, I'm a trustee of a charity called Buy Pride UK, and we actually organise a Pride. We organised the first um, Buy Pride in the UK last year. And as part of that work, I went to, I think it was 15 Prides last year. And I am so intensely feeling the lack of that community. Um, and so I think celebrating it during lockdown is so important, so, so important to me just to be reminded that the community is there, particularly for anyone who feels isolated, um, perhaps due to where they are in lockdown and with whom they're in lockdown. Excellent. Am I correct to some um, by Pride UK? Is, is it going online this year? Am I correct to... It is, co correct. I've accidentally done a little plug for it. It's this right. weekend. Nothing like a plug. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. And Joe, I don't know so, how, how you feel about sort of the importance of celebrating Pride throughout lockdown. Oh, it, it's, it, it's so important. And um, you know, we'll be having a little party in the garden with uh, flags and, and, uh, and, and my kids and, you know, what's happening mates and things like that. It's incredibly important for all the, for the reasons that, you know, that Anna's talked about. It's a huge sense of um, uh, community that, that, you know, that, that we need to, to, to keep alive. I suppose, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's been a big part for me. It's just that, that realisation that, you know, I mean, I'm quite fond of London Pride myself, but also the sort of smaller regional ones like Essex Pride as you go to. And it's just, it's crazy to think that connecting with anyone in that sort of audience and now it's all, you know, sort of virtual. So no, definitely. Let's take to our next question. Uh, I have started my research on the firm and initially I got the sense that the firm placed a lot of emphasis on extracurricular activities and the person as a whole. However, I have noted that there is a lot of emphasis on academics. As an average student, what advice would you give to really stand out, given those circumstances? Don't know, maybe if, if Anna at all you wanted to start, perhaps? If you had just any sort of advice on sort of going with that at all? Sorry, I was trying to see the question. Is it on, on how to stand out? Uh, yeah. it, uh, it's in the chat rather than yeah, the Q&A. Ah, oh, thank you, Joe. Sorry, while I read that, Joe, do you want I'm to jump, start? Jumping. Yeah, sure, and I'm, 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 I'm happy to. Um, I, mean, I think we, we do place a lot of emphasis on, on the whole person and, um, and, and extracurricular is, is very important. I've you know, said already, it's, we don't want people who are just going to blend in and, you know, we're not there to mould people. We're there to, you know, to help shape people, but really it needs to come from, from within and, and we facilitate it and, and we encourage it. Um, it's an academic, it's an academic study. Um, and you know there is a certain level of, of academics which um, are you know Im important you know to, to, to achieve. Um, having said that, we apply the um, as well as doing um, a blind assessment, which, we, which we've talked about already on, on the application forms. We also use the rare um, application um, filter. Um, so where, for example, you can have you know outstanding students who who, who might be at a, a an underperforming school. Um, and so, you know, getting CCC at A level um, in, in that school is fantastic because the average payment is, you know, two E's at A level, for example. And um, then we run those filters um, on, our, on our application process um, so that students who, who, who are bright um, but have underperformed um, in, in academics, but, you know, for reasons around um, those kind of filters, which are often to do with socioeconomic and things like that. Um, will continue to get a chance because we will see that person as a high achieving person. Um, but, you know, the truth is that, um, you know, law is, a, it, it, is, 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 it can be very intellectually challenging um, and, you know, and good academics are, are a good solid base to build a legal career on for us and, and, and many other firms. Fantastic. <laughs> don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that to Anna about sort of, I don't, I don't I appreciate Joe's covered that quite comprehensively. Yeah, that, that was great. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. No worries, fantastic. I'm going to take us to, I think we've got time for probably two more questions. I'm going to take this one from the Q&A section. Uh, it asks, do you think there will be permanent changes to the industry from coronavirus? I suppose on the commercial awareness front. I don't know, but I said, Anna, maybe if you want to start. That yeah. out there. Sure. Um, I, I think there probably will. I think the biggest change will probably be people 
um, working from home more and working more flexibly. And so one thing that I think about a lot is at the moment, previously, for an employee to have a flexible working arrangement whereby they worked at unusual hours or from home certain days, they would have had to make a request for that. And, you know, um, employers do sometimes turn them down. I personally think it's going to be more difficult for employers to turn down those requests and to insist on people being in the office working certain hours because we've seen so many more people working flexibly in that way. So I, I think that will probably be a big impact. Um, hopefully one positive that will come of that. Fantastic. And Joe, I don't know if it's what, what no, you... No, I think I agree. I think that would be the biggest change. Fantastic. Whereas, uh, do you have any advice on how Pride Networks can collaborate with other networks? I think, Anna, this might be a question for you, considering... Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, so, yeah, very timely, actually. One thing that we in the LGBT strand at Lewis Open have been doing over the past two weeks has been collaborating with the BAME strand at Lewis Silken. I think it's not only something you can do, I think it's something you must do. I think any marginalised identity intersects with others. I think you know, this is something we're all going to be quite familiar with now. Um, and to act as if they operate in a bubble would be quite disingenuous and wouldn't really be doing justice to your whole workforce thinking about it from the, you know, the employer point of view. You want to make sure everybody's represented. Um, so we have been you know, opening up discussions with them and saying we'd like to collaborate, we'd like to support, that sort of thing. Um, then I suppose you could also think of it from a point of view of networks interacting with networks from other organisations. I think it is a really fantastic opportunity for networking, meeting more people, or finding a way you can connect with people at different organisations at different levels going to LGBT events and you know, finding ways you can collaborate on those. I would really recommend that actually over my experience of being involved with the LGBT network at most of my employers. It's been only positive in terms of making connections across the company. Excellent. Uh, on to another question. Do you think one day we won't need Pride Networks? Joe? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that at all. Oh, I, that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? Um, just as I hope one day we wouldn't need, um, you know, women networks as well. Um, so yes, surely that's nirvana. We don't need networks because it just ceases to be, uh, just ceases to be an issue or, or something that is is worthy of um, you know, a network. So yes, that that would be fantastic. It's so strange, isn't it? It's almost like the purpose of the network is to erase the need for the purpose of the network. <laughs> exactly. Network. But I think it's for me academically i completely agree with that but actually sitting where we are at the moment it's almost inconceivable to me particularly if you look at what's happening in the world right now i'm thinking from lg plus lgb plus point of view look at what is happening with, with trans rights potentially in the uk uh, it certainly feels like a very long way off that we wouldn't need pride and we wouldn't need um um allies as well and i imagine that must be particularly I suppose interesting yeah especially from your position with the work you do is as you mentioned a lot of things around grievances you probably see a lot of you know disputes that arise on these sort of lines and I, I guess that must yeah kind of not hammer the point home that sounds terribly depressing but you know it sort of gives you that sort of heightened sort of realization i suppose fantastic mm -hmm. well i think i'm going to finish our questions there uh i would like to thank joe and anna from lewis silkin for talking to us this afternoon it's been you know really really lovely to talk to you if i appreciate we haven't got around to all of the questions this afternoon unfortunately and if you have do have any questions uh, for anna or joe their emails along with uh, some other goodies will be coming to you in the follow-up emails we'll have that out to you shortly uh, i've been delightful said i've been george wright of my g work if you don't know who we are, we're an LGBT business platform that aims to put students, allies, graduates um, in contact with one another, but also with LGBT inclusive companies, uh, events uh, and news. So you can sign up for free over at our website. Thank you very much, everyone. It has been delightful and I will see you all when I see you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.